Welcome to Healing XJWS Radio at blogtalkradio.com. I am your host, Augusta Nastasio, and uh, that was the Adams Road Band. We had them on uh, the first two weeks of August. Go ahead and uh, check out those programs at uh, blogtalkradio.com backslash Healing XJWS, and their website is adamsroadband.com, and that is the self-entitled CD, Book of Life, and that is the uh, song title for the CD. Um, today we have a special guest. Uh, it's not the first time we've had Adventists on the program. I uh, just want to encourage our listeners to go to our archives. We have an extensive archives, and we are doing something special in the last couple weeks. Last week we had Dr. Mike Morrison from the formerly known as Worldwide Church of God, um, now Grace Communion Church, and we are seeing the parallels of what we call the religious cousins of the Jehovah's Witnesses and um, the, the common uh, parallels that they have with one another. I think that you would find a lot of parallels as far as some of the legalism with the Seventh-day Adventists, especially the dietary laws, um, with the Worldwide Church of God uh, that was mentioned by Dr. Mike Morrison. We're going to have him again on later this month, so... Uh, in two weeks, we should have Dr. Mike Morrison at a 2 o'clock time. Uh, the other two programs we uh, featured Adventists on and uh, or an Adventist author on was um, the December 17, 2011 program. Look for it on the archives, and that was with Elmer Weeb, and he had written a book. Um, it was called uh, Who is the Adventist Jesus?, and um, we also had Roland McKenzie, and that was on December 10th, 2011, and he's a former member of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, and he has a terrific site called gospeloutreach.net. So um, go back on the archives, listen to those programs. I think um, the Elmer Weeb program, we actually had an Adventist call in, uh, a co-worker of Nate Beckman, um, and it looks like uh, Nate is not on the show today. But, you know, keep our prayers with uh, Nate and his family as he's working hard to support his family. And so without further ado, we're going to go to our guest. And he has several websites, uh, lifeassuranceministries.com, uh, ratzlaf, R-A-T-Z-L-A-F, dot com, and lifeassuranceministries.org. He's a uh, former Seventh-day Adventist pastor, which he served for 13 years, seven at uh, Monterey Bay Academy, and he's uh, authored four books, and um, two of one I'm, um, I'm currently in the middle of reading, and uh, one was a short book, which really gives you a great synopsis of Adventist teaching. Uh, the four books are Sabbath in Christ, The Cultic, Do the Cultic Doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists, and the truth about the Seventh Day Adventist truth, which is the story of him and his wife Carolyn coming out of the Adventist Church, and um, Adventist to Christian. And so, um, without further ado, we want to welcome Dale Ratzliff, who's on a gospel tour. Hello, Dale. You there? Yes. Good morning. <laughs> yeah. So, so um, uh, you're on a gospel tour now, and um, so what? You're, are you currently in? You're not in Arizona right now. Where are you at now? Uh, we uh, we left Arizona June 25. We went all the way up to Alaska, and then on the way back, we had a number of little meetings in Canada and several in, uh, in Washington and Oregon, and uh, now we're at Yuba City in California, and I have uh, three presentations tonight to uh, some former Adventists and maybe even an Adventist or two. <laughs> oh, great, great, fantastic. Um, uh, I've actually, in, we have um, on Facebook, I have encountered a, former Jehovah's Witness who's actually embraced the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So um, <laughs> um, that's why we do these programs. Uh, it's called Healing XJWS. But um, I think that sometimes um, ex-members, of whether they're ex-Adventists, ex-Mormons, or ex-Jehovah's Witnesses, believe that they're free just because they've exited the cult of their origin. But um, one is not free until they're truly free in Christ and uh, not relying on organizations to, to think for them, to do doctrine for them, but um, to be truly free in the grace of Christ. And um, 
And I think um, your story, I, 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 I'm reading your story in your book, and Dale, you're a hard worker. <laughs> you you have gone through some tough times, and um, and it's just um, uh, it's an amazing journey that, that I'm, I'm reading uh, as I'm reading through your story, uh, and uh, and you you are, seem to be a jack of all trades. You, you pretty much can do anything. Well, I the, the Lord has given me a, a wide uh, a wide range of talents, I guess, or guess whatever. Anyway, uh, I've had to do a number of things. My dad died when I was just a kid, and I became the man of the house and uh, earned the living and um, learned to do different things. And somehow, you know, looking back, I'm 76 now on my journey and my continuing journey. It seems like one thing prepares you for the next, right. and it's amazing. As I look back, I can see God's hand, even though at the time I thought, uh, you know, it certainly wasn't God's hand, but it was. So I just praise him for his goodness and uh, his sovereignty and, and working all things together for good. Yeah, you know, I, and I, I I really do think that um, God has been working in your life because um, there was a, a particular uh, I think magnificent moment in, in in your walk in what I've read, and how you had this job. You finally got a, a good job offer, and and um, and yet you had this calling to you know go ahead and 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 to serve. Uh, you know you had this calling to serve as a pastor, and um, and so you had to sell your car, which you had a car payment on for. An older model car, but <laughs> but it just it all just happened. It was like all of it just was just a sign that God was pushing you in this direction to to follow you know your 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 calling as a pastor and um, and I just was like uh, I was like Amen, you know God was working in life pushing you to you know to your goal and um, and sometimes it just happens like that. You just can see God working in your life powerfully. Yes, uh, that was a very unique experience. I um, was musing with the Lord, uh, you know, how I should go back and take theology. Uh, I had just gone through a situation where I thought I was on my deathbed, and after I fully gave my heart to Christ, uh, understood that uh, it was His work that saved me and not my own, I was as well in a couple of days. And, and I was thinking I would go back to uh, to theology uh, to take that in college, and I had a um, uh, a car I was making payments on. It was an old uh, Falcon Ranchero, and I was I'm kind of thought in my mind if I could get an old Chevy. And at that time, they were not classics, an old '57, '55, '6 Chevy. Uh, I could make it back to school. And the next day, somebody came up without me even putting the for sale sign. Uh, in that car, and knocked at my door and said, "I'd like to trade my my old Chevy for your car. I'll take over the payments." At that time, the banks let you do that. Wow. Um, if if uh, if I would take his car for my equity, and and um, I said, "Okay, Lord, here I am." <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Now, um, your your parents were uh, were they Adventists? Yes, uh, I'm, I'm a fourth-generation Seventh-day Adventist. Uh, mm-hmm. My grandfather on my mother's side was a Adventist pastor. His, uh, my grandmother was a, what they call a Bible worker, gave evangelistic Bible studies. Her brother was one of the vice presidents of the General Conference. Uh, my dad and mom both at uh, that time taught in Adventist schools and mm-hmm. uh, were missionaries in Panama when I was just a baby. So, yeah, we were... Uh, <laughs> We were in Adventism up to our eyeballs. I mean, we and we believed the whole thing. I mean, we we uh, were very loyal supporters um, of Adventism. Yeah, cause I, I noticed in, in your book you, you you come up several times on how you were letter to the law, especially on on the dietary restrictions, and you were surprised at how some people were, you know, actually breaking <laughs> the, the rules. Yes, um, I think you're probably thinking about one time I was uh, what they call canvassing, selling religious books door to door. Right. Uh, Ellen White's books, and um, 
my supervisor, uh, we went, he, he took us out to lunch and he whispered to me, he said, Dale, I'm going to order some meat. Uh, please yes. don't tell me. And, uh, at the time, uh, you know, I, I was a strict vegetarian because Ellen White said that if uh, before the second coming, only those who had given up meat would be, uh, you know, be translated, which is another word for raptured, you might say. Uh-huh. And he said he had to eat meat so he wouldn't lose weight, and he was overweight, and I had a hard time with that one. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that's really the minor point, you know, um, the dietary thing, um, you know, I have just no problem I have with, with vegetarians or, or meat eaters, you know, whatever. It doesn't make a bit of difference to me anymore. Um, and my whole ministry is uh, centered on the gospel. And the only reason we, um, in a sense, we mention Adventism in our journals, and you may mention those sometime, um, is that Adventism undermines the gospel in many ways of which they're not even aware. And I was not aware of the um, of the multitude of places and ways that the gospel is uh, compromised in Adventism until I was out of Adventism and began to study the scriptures all by themselves. Uh, because as an Adventist, I was taught to, um, for example, when I was in the seminary, I taught how to make a sermon. I said, well, go ahead and, and study the Bible, you know, look at your commentaries, the Greek words and everything, and then check it with Ellen White to make sure that you've interpreted it right. And so that even though they claim that uh, the scriptures are their uh, authority, it's the scriptures interpreted by the writings of Ellen White. And uh, we were just speaking with some uh, former Adventists last night that have been out of the church for some years. And they said it's amazing. Uh, the particular situation was the wife was an Adventist and the husband was not. And he said that she would say, well, the Bible says such and such. She said, oh, no, that's not. Where does the Bible say that? And she thought she was quoting the Bible, but actually Ellen White. Wow. And I found for years after I was out of the Adventist church, even pastoring in another church, a, a evangelical church, there would be times that I would think that something was in the Bible, and I had read it so often in Ellen White that uh, the two became kind of the gray, kind of mixed, and I, I see that. And when you set her aside and, and read the Bible only, you'll see more and more errors uh, pop up in Adventism that were, uh, you might say, behind the veil before. Right. Now, now uh, uh, you met your wife, and uh, but you, you met your wife as you, you were, uh, I guess, you, you know, as, as a teenager, right? Is that, no. Uh, at, no, I met my wife when I was in the fourth grade, and she was in the third grade. Right, right. You were childhood <laughs> friends. Yeah, it, 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 we, we were we were both boyfriend and girlfriend in those days. I mean, what, what are what you know those little kids could do? But we, uh, I used to give her sticks of gum and wink at her, and you know we we kind of. <laughs> uh, and it's interesting uh, when my mother died; she lived to be ninety nine and three quarters uh, in her. Belongings. And when we celebrated our 50 years of wedding, uh, 50 uh, anniversary, uh, Carolyn was going through her um, items that she left, and she found a little envelope that had a uh, uh, a little card in it, uh, a Valentine, and she wondered why in the world my mother had kept that. And she looked on the back uh, on it, and, it, and it was her signature that she gave me in the uh, when she was a third grader in, in Phoenix, Arizona. And it said, uh, it was a blindfolded uh, girl chasing a boy, and it says, even though I can't see you, I can seize you. And she gave that to me, uh, and it was Love Caroline. She gave that to me when she was in the third grade. So we have quite oh. a moment. We, um, we got together in high school again. Um, that was kind of a miracle too. We, we, both of our parents, my father died and my mother moved to Med near Modesto and, and her folks moved to uh, near Modesto, not actually in the town. And we saw each other on the bus again and made friends and, uh, we've been, um, friends ever since. <laughs> and now you, but you didn't get married until later on, um, after, we, it, during, 
yeah, in college? During college, yeah. After my first year of college, we got married. Yeah. Now, um, do you, you have any? You have siblings, right? Because you you grew up on a farm, I, right? Uh, well, actually, it was in the country. Uh, in a sense, it was on a farm. I have one sister, an older sister, who's still a very strict Adventist, and I can't even uh, discuss religion with her. Why? Wow. Uh, she says that uh, she knows what she believes, and she doesn't want to be confused, and that's where it stops. Wow. And, but uh, and Carolyn comes from a long line of Adventists also, right? Yeah, she's a multi-generational Adventist and has um, four sisters, and uh, some of them are out, some are half out, and one is very strongly still in. So, um, and... So you, you you went to college, um, and you had a problem in theology, right? What was <laughs> well, yeah, well, uh, I actually loved theology, but um, I was taking Greek. Right. And we were studying Ephesians 2, uh, as I recall, uh, 8 and 9. I was translating that, and, and I recognized that, you know, a person could say they were saved, you know, for by grace we have been saved, and uh, right. it was kind of a, a one-time event. So I went to uh, Fred Veltman, who was my, uh, Dr. Fred Veltman, my uh, Greek teacher, and I said, Fred, you know, something's wrong here because Ellen White says we can't say we're saved because we don't know if we're going to be faithful in the future. Mm-hmm. And he uh, he gave me a very insightful uh, answer. He said, Dale, we should get our theology from the Bible. And at the time I thought, you know, I'm not sure he's a real strong Adventist. <laughs> <laughs> But I really appreciate that because he um, he was a, a big influence in my interpretation of Scripture. He said, Dale, he said, when we go to the Bible and, and study it, and this has been my uh, my my way of, uh, of studying, I've tried to do this, is that he says we want to make sure that we get everything that the Scripture says in a particular passage. Get it all out. Don't Don't leave anything there that you don't understand. But don't read anything else into it. And I think that's the secret is, is let Scripture speak clearly for itself. Uh, completely, but mm-hmm. don't read anything into it. And it's amazing how many times uh, that other people, uh, and maybe in my past too, that I have read things into Scripture that really weren't there. Right. Right. Amen. Now, um, uh when when you started going through you, you were serving as a pastor when 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 you started questioning your Adventist roots, is that correct? Yes, I was teaching at Monterey Bay Academy and um hmm. the uh, first inkling I had that something was wrong, um I could give kind of a little interesting scenario. Uh I was in, in the Southern California Conference of uh, Seventh day Adventists. I was in the L.A. area, uh, Santa Monica, Hacienda Heights, a couple of different times there. And uh, the conference asked the uh, uh, the group to come over and talk about this four spiritual laws, um, and they did. And uh, because at that time, I think the Adventist Church was trying to, uh, some of the leaders were try- trying to move it toward evangelical theology. Mm-hmm. But anyway, it was really interesting. In the restroom, uh, you know, uh, one of the other pastors said, what in the world did we do calling these Babylonians in here to try to teach us the gospel? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, I was teaching at Monterey Bay Academy. This is fast forward a little bit uh, in, in Central California, just near the Bay Area. And... Um, one of the I was teaching Bible doctrines to the juniors, and the curriculum for one quarter was to go through the first eight chapters of Romans. And I did that for seven years while I was there. And one cannot go through the Book of Romans without seeing clearly the gospel. Right. And I remember uh, distinctly uh, understanding what the faith of Abraham was that it was believing what God had declared, even though there was no evidence of it. You know, God counted him righteous. Right. Uh, because he believed that he would uh, have posterity like the like the stars, okay? And when I realized that was what justification by faith was, it really turned the gospel on. And mm-hmm. then there were a series of events that happened that were really not my uh, instigation. All of them 
I think, well, maybe one of them was. I may have ordered a cassette tape. The first one was um, uh, Des Ford was a theologian in, in Australia, and uh, he had been on to the, uh, the secret committee that met for five years in the Adventist church. And maybe I'll just take a little parenthesis and explain what that was. Mm -hmm. Uh, Des Ford and others um, came to realize that uh, the investigative judgment could not be proven from Scripture, and and it rested on 22 assumptions, most of which were contrary to the evidence. And those that, that weren't were still assumptions, not facts. And... In the 50s, when the Adventists were working on their Bible commentary, uh, Raymond Cottrell was their best Hebrew scholar, uh, an an Aramaic scholar. And so he was assigned the section in Daniel. Daniel 8.14 is the key text upon which Adventism was built. And uh, he uh, could not get Adventist theology, the whole investigative judgment thing, from that, um, that text. And so he went to the... Uh, I think his name was uh, Dr. Lowe, uh, who was in, in charge of the committee for the commentary. And they said, we can't get theology, Adventist theology from this. So they went to R.R. Figure, who was the general conference president at that time. And he said, okay, here's what you do. You form a super secret committee. You get the best minds of Adventism, and you work on this problem until it's solved. Hmm. So they formed a, a committee called the Problems in Daniel Committee, and it met for five years. And Des Ford was one of the people that gave a presentation to that committee. But at the end of five years, they, they could not solve it. They knew that it, it did not support Adventist theology. And so they said, well, what are we going to do? Are we going to say Adventists are wrong? And anyway, to make a long story short, they finally uh, disbanded the committee and left no minutes as if they had never met and they, they instructed the pastors to continue to teach the investigative judgment, and, and then this is, this is a quote, based on traditional assumptions. Anyway, I, so uh, I didn't know about that. I went to the seminary, uh, have an MDiv and almost a doctor of ministry, and I, and I was never told anything about that at the seminary. But Dr. Raymond Cottrell, when he retired, uh, so that his uh, financial uh, income was secure, he gave a presentation to an Adventist forum in San Diego explaining that whole thing. And so I knew that that was a, a problem that the church had known about. And then going back to Monterey Bay Academy now again, Bess Ford uh, came over to um, Monterey Bay Academy on a vacation. He spent a couple of weeks there. And I used to run with him on the beach. We ran together, and he was older than me. And uh, I, I used to run six miles on the beach often in the morning. So I tried to run slow to let him, you know, not get out of breath and find out right. he was a better runner than me. Anyway, he went up to Pacific Union College just north of uh, where I was teaching and gave a presentation on the 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 problems with the investigative judgment. And I had always had a problem with it ever since uh, in school. And he was immediately uh, taken from ministry, taken from his position as uh, uh, a theologian at Pacific Union College and given six months to prepare a paper why he should uh, continue in the Adventist ministry. Well, in those six months, he wrote a thousand pages and one day at a camp meeting, and that was not to be released. It was only for those people who were at the committee to try him. And uh, But it, somebody leaked it, and I think I know who, but I won't mention that right now. Mm-hmm. And, and it was given to me. And I said, okay, I've had trouble with this. So I read it, the whole thousand pages, and I, and I got done and I said, you know, there is nothing to this doctrine. It's based on, on, on sand and a, a false interpretation uh, of prophecy that they just refuse to admit error. Uh, and about that time, I got a, a, a series of about five or six tapes, long tapes, from uh, a meeting that had been held in the basement of the Glendale Church by Walter Ray, showing that Ellen White was a, a plagiarist. She had plagiarized huge amounts of materials, even in her testimonies. Mm-hmm. And so I knew those two things. 
And then on top of that, I discovered the gospel. And uh, so I, I knew now all these things. I knew the gospel conflicted with Adventism. I knew Ellen White was a plagiarist. I knew that the investigative judgment was wrong, and I knew the church had known it was wrong and covered it up. So I was at a, a, in, in a difficult position, um, and I was pastoring at the time. Uh, I, I left the teaching Bible and was pastoring at church. I was working on my uh, doctoral program. And I gave one of the tapes, uh, I think it was Dick Cockrell's tape, to one of my elders. Well, that was the beginning of the end because word got out that I had, you know, leaked that out and I got called in. And anyway, make a long story short, I had to promise to teach the investigative judgment doctrine to resign. Well, I couldn't do it, so I resigned. Wow. And I just praise God that I did. I mean, at the time it was... Uh, we had just built a, a new house. Uh, my wife and I were both employed um, by the church. At that time, interest rates, so that's back in the Carter years, I guess, uh, they were, we had 12% on our first and 18 on our second. Can you imagine that? Mm. <laughs> and we, we lost our jobs. And we thought that we would uh, lose our house, but we said we're going to be true to Scripture uh, but the Lord, you know, we never missed a payment on that house. The Lord wow. provides. Wow. Wow. So God provides. Now, uh, for, for our Go listening ahead. audience, um, give them a, a brief synopsis of what the investigative judgment is. Uh, I, I know that it, it has to do with a reinterpretation of a reinterpretation of a reinterpretation of 1844, which was 1843, that became 1844. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, let, let me just run through that. Okay, Adventism was was founded on the the prophecy of William Miller that Christ was going to come in 1843, and he had a chart. I don't know if you read my book called The Cultic Doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists. Have you read that book? I, I have it, but I haven't read it. I, I'm 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 still reading okay. your biography. Okay. Anyway, uh, he had 15 different proofs, uh, lines of prophecy that ended in 1843, and they're absolutely ridiculous if you read them. They're all 15 uh, repeated in that uh, cultic doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists. Mm -hmm. And he had a big chart, and um, I, I have it, uh, have his uh, copy of his original chart. And uh, Ellen White said that God showed her that the figures on that chart were exactly as he wanted them and they should never be changed, okay? That's in the early writings. So she cements that in, all right? And then <clears throat> Christ didn't come in 1843, so they said, well, it was, we got a date wrong. It was actually October 22, 1844. Well, when October 22, 1844 came and Christ didn't, then they said, well, what really happened was that Christ moved from the holy place into the most holy for the first time up in heaven, uh, which is contrary to Hebrews 6. And, um, and, and then they said, unless you knew about that, Satan would interpret your prayers because you would be praying to the wrong place. And that unless you knew that, uh, you didn't have salvation, and and they taught the shut door of mercy that that the door of mercy was only open for those who had accepted that that view of eschatology uh, on October 22, 1844, and they held that shut door uh, teaching for some years, and Ellen, they, some of them gave it up, and Ellen White had a vision that taught it again, and then later she denied that, so she actually told the lie, and it, it's very clear. And finally, <clears throat> they realized that their kids were being born now after 1844, and how could they get into the uh, get into the kingdom if if the door of mercy was closed? So they had to open the door of mercy to let their kids in. Uh, then they, um, at first, Adventism had the traditional doctrine of the state of the dead uh, as Christians do, that the dead go to heaven when they die. And Ellen White saw several of the early Adventists uh, in heaven. She, she saw them there. But when they taught the investigative judgment, and I'll, get, I'll, I'll explain that a little bit more in detail in a, in a minute or two, 
they said that, well, the, if the judgment started in 1844, then nobody could be in heaven. So they had to pull those people back out of heaven, and they did that by uh, suppressing those statements, uh, both in James and Ellen. Um, they they kind of left those statements out in, as they republished some of their books. <clears throat> Now, so that's the history of the investigative judgment. You know, it was, it's built on, like you say, a false prophecy, a reinterpretation of that prophecy, the shut door, and then not the shut door, and then it was morphed into the investigative judgment. Mm. You know, the judgment is a very complicated, um, complicated uh, doctrine, and it's totally without any scriptural support. Period. What it teaches is that in October 22, 1844, Christ moved into the most holy place for the first time. And then then he started going over the records of people's lives, starting with Adam uh, and each successive generation to uh, to the living. And And nobody knows when your name is going to come up in judgment. And when it does, you will be judged uh according to the Ten Commandments uh, of your obedience, uh, you know, to the Ten Commandments at that point in time. Now, if you have committed sins and ask forgiveness for them, um, they're forgiven. But if you have forgotten sins, they will be held against you. Can you imagine that? Mm. Okay. And then what happens now is just before the Second Coming, there is a period of time that is not defined in Adventism. Um, there's a, a time called the latter reign where they're still looking for some uh, empowering of the Holy Spirit to help them develop perfection and full sanctification. And they teach that they will have to live in the sight of a holy God without an intercessor in their human bodies, Okay. So there'll be a time when God says it is done and the judgment is totally finished in heaven. And there's a time of trouble on earth. And the Adventists during that time, um, those they teach that there's going to be a, a, a first a national Sunday law and then a universal Sunday law. And that the people who worship on Sunday, especially former Adventists, are going to try to put Adventists to death. And during that time, they're taught that they should flee to the mountains and flee to the hills. Uh, and, the, and the test will be over the Sabbath. And they will say that the Sabbath is the final test. And Ellen White said, God will never, never allow anyone into heaven who does not have his signet mark. And, and in context, it's the Sabbath. And those who worship on Sunday will receive the mark of the beast. And so during that time of trouble, the Adventists are, are, are fleeing from those that are trying to put them to death. They have a choice to worship on Sunday and get the mark of the beast or worship on Sabbath, and they think they're going to be put to death. And then at that point, uh, at the end of the judgment, God takes, or Christ takes the sins. Now, let, let me just kind of back off and explain a little thing here. Adventists use the Old Testament sanctuary, especially the Day of Atonement, as the pattern for what goes on in heaven. And in the Day of Atonement, there were two goats. There was a Lord's goat and a scapegoat. And they believe the scapegoat is Satan. Mm -hmm. And so in the Old Testament, the the priest uh, would slay the Lord's goat, and he would place the sins of the people on the scapegoat, and he'd be led into the wilderness. So, uh, and, and they see the whole uh, Old Testament sanctuary um, program as a transfer of sin, not a an atonement or eradication from sin. And this is really key. So, the, when you when the blood goes in, it just transfers the sin to the sanctuary. And then on the Day of Atonement, the the sin is transferred to the scapegoat. So they teach that when Christ went to heaven, he took, he transferred the sins of the righteous up to heaven, and that pollutes the heavenly sanctuary, if you can believe that. Hmm. And then he takes those sins and places them on Satan, 
And she says, and Satan will uh, be punished for the sins of the righteous and for the sins that he had caused the righteous to commit. And I've been trying to back away from that, but it's pretty clear. So in essence, uh, Satan becomes the final sin bearer, and he is the one that receives the full penalty for sin when he burns in the lake of fire. And he's not going to burn forever, just a, a, a period of time. Um, mm. So that basically is investigative judgment. And the thing of it is, though, it just creates a tremendous amount of insecurity and fear in Adventists if, if they really understand that. Now, there's many Adventists today who don't even know much about that teaching. Uh, they've kind of swept it under the rug, so to speak. Yeah, because you could but, essentially be judged at any time in your life. Exactly. And it, it doesn't matter what you do after the judgment. Once you've been judged, you've been judged at that point, right? Well, well yeah. See, she says you don't know, uh, and this is a fearful time during judgment. The sealing work is almost over, she said, and that's, you know, when, when God God seals the believers that are keeping the Sabbath. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainty in that. And to give you an example, we, I won't mention names, but we've stopped off and visited some former Seventh-day Adventists uh, a couple of days ago on our on our gospel tour, some friends of ours that we've known for years. And the mother was uh, 92, I think, uh, still in pretty decent health. And uh we ask, you know, are you assured of your salvation? She says, well, I hope I'll be ready. You know, you can't know. I hope so. I've tried to do my best. And and that's very, very common in Adventism. There is really no assurance of salvation. Mm-hmm. Now, some, there are some pastors who are teaching the gospel in Adventism. Um, but... Still, they still teach the anti-gospel doctrine, so it's it's a very confusing mix right now in Adventism. It looks like we have a, a caller, and, and I think they might be possibly Adventist by by what I see here. So uh, let let's see what they're going to say. Uh, Neshamaya. Yes. Hello. Yes. yes. How are you doing this morning? Hi. Right. You doing and well? Yes, I am not a Seventh Day Adventist, but any means, but okay. I do believe that the Sabbath was consecrated from the very beginning as a memorial uh, for a holy kingdom. And how can you prepare for a holy kingdom unless you know what holiness is, unless you discern what is the will of the Creator from above? And uh, mm-hmm. there's a lot of scripture in, uh, for instance, Isaiah 58 that mentions that particularly. It talks about those who keep his Shabbat, but it's talking about the idea about not after the idle or vain words of man. So, I mean, there's a lot there to be understood because think about it. I mean, Messiah himself said the greatest command is in effect what is called the Shema. Hero Israel, the Lord our Lord is one. You have to love him with all our minds, heart, soul, and might. The only way we can do that is after a pure and perfect truth, and that's an immutable truth. Now, being that it's an immutable truth and no man after the flesh can change anything in it, which is really the, the theme of the whole entire book of Galatians, Mm-hmm. recognizing the fact that, like I said, what the Most High has consecrated and confirmed from the beginning, no man can add or change anything in it, then we have to understand that there is an absolute law that must be, must, must, must be observed. Or else we say that man, after his flesh, can change things in it, and then we often ultimately get the possibility of a holy kingdom. There's a serious problem with, uh, I think, a lot of the way things are being taught today among the churches, because quite frankly, I don't believe what's being taught in the, what people call churches today is in any respect true to what the early church called it, the early, pe- early believers called a church, if you mm-hmm. want to call it that. In other words, what I mean by that is this. The early church, monotheist people in the East, before Western intrusion, knew absolutely that the, the day would come when all confusion would be cast aside. And understand what I mean by say all confusion. I mean all presumptuousness on the part of human, let's just say, misadministration, uh, the presumptuousness of the flesh, the pretenses that men call wise and call religion because, well, let's be Mm -hmm. real about it. Uh, A lot of the times when men have fallen under fallen standards, what they've basically done is call it religion or some form of political uh, entity having some kind of authority so people don't see their sins. So when we understand that basic context, I mean, think about it. 
Isaiah 41 through 42, particularly around 41, 24 through 42, 4, uh, relative to Isaiah 40, what, 27 through 41, 4. What does that scripture really mean when it says, they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength? And this is what I'm saying. They who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. Gain power to become sons of God. Uh, gain power, if you will, to see beyond the veils of the misconceits of man. Realize what's really being said here. I think there's a serious problem. When the scripture says not under the law but under grace, for instance, it really means not under the polytheist fleshly misimaginings of man because, I mean, the polytheist law was the preservation of all the false gods who supported the king. So think about it. Pagans didn't have a word to relate the difference between divine law and man's law. So if they didn't have a word to relate the difference between divine law and man's law because they wanted to be called gods, then realize what's happening. The only law that he then knew were the authorities. Messiah said you must, your rights must exceed that, if you will, of the status quo. Else you won't enter the kingdom of God because they seek to negate the law and the prophets. What is the law and the prophets if it's not the gospel? What is the law and the prophets if it's not a word from above? If we seek to negate everything that is a word from above, you don't have divine law, whose law are you under? I see a serious, serious problem. And that most don't realize, how shall you exceed the status quo or the standards or the fallen standards of this world? The grace of Yah calls men to consider what other men wouldn't consider. Because only a pure and perfect word offers one choice. There's a serious you, I, problem. Uh, so uh, what what church do you go to? Uh, you're a black Israelite or Assemblies of Yahweh or House of Yahweh? Bruh, I'll make a long story short. When I had my calling, straight out, i tell you exactly what the Creator told me. He mm. told me some of the biggest lies have been told to hide the greatest truths. And he told me I better listen to him or somebody will make a fool out of me. Mm. He told me that the greatest wisdom is not what people think they know or what they don't know. But what they think they know, not taking all things in consideration, has not been wisdom at all. And what he really told me in a whole lot of respects was this. He said, look, please understand. And I'm thankful that he gave me that prayer. And you know what he told me to start praying? And he hit me with that in my heart to say, say, Father, I don't know what I don't know. I don't know what I need to know. I don't know what's been stuck in my head that acts as an obstacle to my understanding or being truly the light that you intend your people as habitation of your spirit to be. But, Father, you know. And if you won't tell me, I won't know. I think the problem is, by and large, people don't even understand today, by and large, what faith is. When the scripture says, by grace through faith, you saved ultimately, what it's saying is by the gift that the creator reveals, by his gift, he reveals something that's beyond the conversation and the thoughts and the works and devices and uh, uh, presumptuous uh, pretenses of men. By his grace, his favor, he reveals that. And if man will believe that there's a standard beyond what seems wise to men, then man no longer insults or blasphemes the wisdom of the Creator. He the, begins to accept the will of the Creator and has an opportunity to grow. In but the, the, will. The, the Scripture makes it very clear that it is that you're saved by grace and not of yourselves. But I think we don't not, have to discern the definition of the word grace anymore. Think <clears> about it. Can a man just perceive beyond the will of the flesh or the 30,000 odd different denominations creating obstacles and confusion, people not knowing which to which is which. Can man after his flesh or after his ordinary reasoning mind perceive what he has not seen? In other words, Colossians has a scripture in 2.18 that talks about, you know, watch out lest you watch from Oakland Ministries. Uh, talking about intruding or butting into things in which they have no insight. That's really what it means if you want to translate it. In other words, if man does not have a vision from the creator himself, and only the creator can call a man unto authority to preach the gospel, because the gospel is a whole pure and perfect word, and you don't receive or discern what is that pure and perfect standard, lest the creator by his spirit that teaches all things no lie in, in it grants you the power to even begin to grow unto it. So listen to what I'm saying. You've got 30,000 denominations out here teaching partialities and perversions. That is not the emanation of being led by the Holy Spirit that teaches all things, no lie in it, that we all have one standard, pure and completion offering one choice. Well, I, I, I hate to say it, brother, but I think you're, you're, you're misunderstanding uniformity for unity. I think you're going to misunderstand if you don't understand what I'm telling you. I uh, have to tell you straight out. I heard this from above. 
And well, you, 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 words, well, you keep on using the word 30,000 denominations like there's, not, there's no unity. I would suggest this to you. I have a show on Blog Talk called Hidden Gospel Reveal. My name is Eddie Mia. I would suggest uh-huh. you all go back and listen to that show very closely. There's a website called HiddenGospel.com. There's much that polytheist mind has not understood about the definition of any words contained in these scriptures. They've taken. Now, what do you mean by polytheist mind? Well, Western polytheism. Understand the rule of Rome was basically this: the East was monotheist, recognizing there's one standard, which is why they look for a Messiah in the first place. They realize there's only one salvation, there's only one consummate truth. Nobody can change anything in it. That's Eastern monotheist mind that from which the, the, the church itself arose, which is why they looked for Messiah in the first place. They knew that nobody's partiality. Scribes, Pharisees, Sadducees, Zealots, Essenes, all these multitudes of different okay. ideas you, cannot brother, be Brother, you you're losing people. You've got you to gotta, uh, explain things in a lot okay. more simple let terminology. Me, me, if, you're talking about, if you're talking about the polytheist mind, are you making a reference to what happened at Nicaea? I'm making a reference to, if you can say that in some respect, exactly, because what... Okay, so you got to be more specific. You got to be more specific because you're losing people. Okay. Well, uh, are, you talking about the, are you talking about the doctrine of the Trinity? I'm talking about, hey, let me tell you something. The Trinitarian doctrine, without question, does not take into consideration what is true meaning of the concept of Godhead. But so so I, I just want to know, is that, what, is that what you're making reference towards? What I'm saying simply is this. Western theology, understand the kings, if you will, or the, 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 the Caesars or whatever you want to call it of Rome, and when they came into the East. I didn't say they came in to bring the faith. The faith is pure and complete. It doesn't have any polytheist presumptions in it. When they came into the East, they, were not, they did not come into the East to bring the faith. They came to destroy it. If any time... Well, brother, I, I hate to break it to you. I hate to break it to you, but in the East... We have what we call Orthodox Christianity, all right? And I know because I, I work in a building filled with them. This They're is what called I'm saying. Ethiopian Coptics, okay? This is what I'm saying. And, 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 Ethiop- and, and, and Orthodoxy, let me tell you, there was, there was no distinction between Western and Eastern. At Nicaea, uh, you had Western Christians and you had Eastern Christians, and they came to an agreement. This is a veneer of present or what was passed. In other words, what I'm saying to you is this. It is truly a blessing if ever the Creator takes your mind back by His Spirit to see what was the mindset of the early church before all these corruptions came in, whereby people have, as the Scriptures say, perverted the grace or the truth of the Creator. Well, you, yeah, you, brother, you gotta be, you got to be more specific. If you're addressing a certain issue, you got to be more specific. You're speaking in ambiguities, and really no one that. knows what you're talking about. And I relate a principle. That's a big problem because most people have not studied enough to understand or asked the creator enough to understand. But let me see if I can help or help a little bit. I'm just what saying I'm, be more specific in what you're addressing. If, you, if you're going to say uh, that there's been confusion, speak uh, exactly what there is confusion about. Trying. Be specific. I'm trying. I'm asking you. In heaven's name, can I do it now? Bro, it sounds like you're talking jive. <laughs> it, it, it sounds like I'm 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 watching airplane again. Don't blaspheme the holy name. Don't blaspheme the holy name. Ask first before you make such a judgment. I'm just saying, be more specific because you're losing my audience. Quiet for a minute and let me do it. You asked me to do it. Let me do it. All right, go ahead and do it then. Thank you. Thank you. What I'm saying to you is this. When I speak of polytheist mindset, what I'm saying is this. Realize what I was trying to say to you all along. When Western polytheist Rome came into the East, when Greece came into the East long before the birth of Messiah, if you understand what I'm saying, if you really understand Daniel 5th chapter, it talks about that system that would come out or that people that would come out of the West. Yeah, now, Roman and Greek mythology was polytheistic, yeah. Okay, let me finish my point. Because, I mean, I don't make any suppositions about what I'm saying, please. Daniel 5th chapter talks about a system or a kingdom that would come out of the West that overthrew the Medo Persian Empire. And the scripture says that polytheist system ultimately would continue to, let's just say, bring about perversions, if you will, till it challenges the prince of princes in the last days. I'm particularly talking about Daniel. Uh, 8 and 5 to 8.25. Okay, well, we understand the Greco-Roman system continued and does continue to this day 
not to preach a pure word. And understand what I mean by that. The entire Western polytheist system. Messiah said, go forth and teach all nations, said baptize. He wouldn't have said baptize if there was a not, not a need for people to be initiated under, under something pure. Right, you know, right, but right. It's the nations. He wouldn't have said that otherwise. As long as corruptions exist, as long as corruptions exist, there's no potential or possibility for holiness. Simply well, stated. Okay, till you teach the pure and perfect word, there will always be contentions and there will always be confusion. What I'm saying to you is what Constantine basically did, since you talk about the Council of Nicaea. What okay. Constantine did. We're finally getting somewhere. That's what I'm trying to get to. He had no concern about the sanctity of the holy name. He had no concern, concern about the sanctity of the first command, the Shema, that all might worship the Creator as one, all comprehending with all the saints what is height, depth, and breadth. He had no concern whatsoever for the sanctity of faith or even what faith is. Because as soon as you turn away from a pure, perfect word or seeking a pure, perfect word beyond the thoughts of men, all you have is a worldly corruption. It's not faith beyond this world at all. Okay. Well, this, I, I hate to break it to you, but Constantine had no say-so in the decision of what happened at Nicaea. He was a, he was a neutral standby and if anything, if anything, he was he leaned towards Arianism, which was the opposite of the trinitarian doctrine. He imprisoned Athanasius twice and held it against Athanasius. Um so brother, I I just suggest that you read a little bit about history before you make assumptions about people in history. And, and and I hate to break it to you, bro, but most of the people that defended the doctrine of the Trinity were black men. Athanasius was a black man. Um, he was from the East. Most of the people that uh, that defended the, the faith and actually uh, that actually taught the doctrine of the Trinity were Africans. So I don't care. I don't I don't want to take away from my guest too too much longer because I, he he I only have him a brief point of time. But I thank you for calling in, bro. And um, you ever heard about Contine's quotes before his deathbed? Yes, I know. That's why I say he was an Aryan sympathizer. Oh, but, but, but I tell you what, I'll give you, I'll give you my personal phone number, and you can call me, and we can discuss that. But I don't want to take any more time from my guests. Okay, it's two zero two two eight one ninety four fifty. Two zero two two eight one ninety four fifty. And if anybody wants to call me and discuss any doctrine, they're free to do so. Um, so thanks for thanks for calling in, Nashamaya. What What's your name again, sir? My name is Gus. Gus. My name is yes. actually Eddie Mia. But like I said, there's a lot of things that need to be looked at. I, I would suggest a good, strong look at my website, HiddenGospel.com. There's articles on there that talk about the multitude of things that have been totally, completely ignored among the churches today because Rome basically outlawed the knowledge of it and killed the folks who did know. So understand, those things have to be restored. And until man ex accepts that pure, perfect foundation is willing to teach all those things that were commanded to be taught, guess what? Nothing that's being taught today is stable, and none of it is salvation. Well, oh, all right, bro. Well, you have a great day, bro. Hey, I, I, I think most of it, he started it off like it needs to be. All right. Take care, bro. And thank you. All righty. Uh, Dale, sorry about that. <laughs> I, I commend you for your patience. Uh, yes. I could. Uh, did you want me to respond to anything you said or not? <laughs> or sure. You... Go ahead. Go ahead. You're my guest, and so I want to give you as much time as possible. Well, I think the uh, I think the whole thing turns on Christ, not on the law. Christ said, "You know, He's the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through Him." And there's no question that it's very clear in Paul's writings that the law came in with Moses and it was to last until Christ. And the the thing that really turns me on to the Lord Jesus Christ is to realize that I'm in him. Uh, over and over again, there's about 200 references in Paul's epistles to being in Christ. And, and when we understand that, it will change our lives. Uh, in fact, that's what I'm speaking about tonight. Uh, when we are uh, spirit baptized, and I'm not talking about speaking in tongues, but 1 Corinthians um, 12, 13 says, you know, you were right. baptized by the Spirit, okay? And that happens the moment we believe. Then we are placed in Christ, and Ephesians says that we are seated with him in heavenly places. 
Right. And if we're in Christ, we have all spiritual blessings. We have we are we are righteous. We are sanctified. Um, you know, there's a whole list of things that we have when we're in Christ Jesus. And you know, when we realize that we are in Him and He is in us, then and then only does anything that we do have any. It's not salvation value. We're we're saved totally by grace. Uh, over and over again, this was the thing that the Adventisms did not really understand. They thought we were saved by grace, and then we had to prove ourselves uh, by works. Uh, in fact, we were in an Adventist church um, not too long ago, and in the prayer, they said, Thank you, Lord, for dying to give us a second probation. <laughs> no. <laughs> that- that's not he he died because he was our savior, not to give right. us a second probation. And when we studied the, the topic of the Sabbath, um I I was a strong believer in the seventh day Sabbath when we uh, left the Seventh day Adventist Church. In fact the first three uh, and we started another church that were mostly oh, Adventists that left with me, uh when they understood the issues they couldn't stay there. I preached three messages why I would never leave the Sabbath. But two years later, somebody said, let's do a, a study, an in-depth study of the Sabbath. And um, after consideration, I said, yes, but let's let's do it this way. Let's throw out all of our presuppositions and let's study, uh, study it from all points of view. And let's not uh, try to prove anything. Rather, let's study only to discover, and we don't know where we're going to end. Right. Uh, and we don't have any preconceived point that we're going to. We were still meeting on Sabbath. We were two years out from Adventism, so we were free from that bondage. And it, we studied that topic every week for seven months with homework, and it was a phenomenal study. And, and the, the key came when we understood the covenants that, you no, know, we're under a new covenant, not the old covenant. And Paul right. says in 2 Corinthians 3 that, you know, when Moses is read, the, the veil is still over their eyes. And until you can remove that veil, you know, you don't see things clearly. Um, but when you understand that we're saved totally by, by, by God, by grace, and when he was talking, he was talking about, you know, the importance of obedience to whatever, he, I wasn't sure what he was saying even, but, Paul in Romans 5, I remember when I read it for the first time, it says, the kind of people God justifies, they are sinners, they are enemies, they are helpless, uh, and they're ungodly. And I said, you know, I can qualify for that. And praise God that our Lord receives sinners while they're still sinners. Amen. And them as saints, and that's the gospel. Um, can I can I just uh, I just wanted to share this this scripture and I, I just think that this really this scripture really really is a dissertation against uh, religious uh, uh, orders that are stuck in the Old Testament, stuck in legalism, and believe that Jesus came to give us an opportunity rather than to save us. And and I don't think anyone can get out of what Paul writes in Colossians chapter two, and he says it very clearly. He says, and and I, and it's a little bit lengthy, but I think it's worth every penny to read this on uh, on the air. Do he it. He says, when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins. Having canceled the chain, the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us, he has taken it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing, triumphing over them by the cross. Therefore, do not let anyone judge you by what you eat or drink or with regard to a religious festival, a new moon celebration, or a Sabbath day. These are a shadow of things that were to come. The reality, however, is found in Christ. Do not let anyone delight in false humility and the worship of angels disqualify you. 
Such a person also goes into great detail about what they have seen. They are puffed up with idle notions by their unspiritual mind. They have lost connection with the head from whom the whole body, supported and held together by its ligaments and sinews, grows as God causes it to grow. Since you died with Christ to the elemental spiritual forces of this world, why, as though you still belong to the world, do you submit to its rules? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. These rules, which have to do with things that are all destined to perish, have an appearance of wisdom with their self-imposed worship, their false humility, and their harsh treatment of the body, but they lack any value in restraining sensual indulgence. So any time a religion tells you, you must do this, that, this, Paul says that our sufficiency is, our sufficiency is in Christ and the finished work on the cross that all of our sins are forgiven. It doesn't say some. It doesn't say we're given them a second opportunity. And I just think that that has been something that has spoken to me as a Jehovah Witness and to you as an Adventist. Amen, brother. Preach it. I might add one little thing that you mentioned there. Um, in verse 16, you know, it says um, new moon, a festival new moon or a Sabbath day. Hmm. Adventist are going to uh, argue to no end that that is not the Seventh-day Sabbath. They're going to say that's that's ceremonial Sabbath. Right. (laughs) And and the the thing is that it is absolutely clear that it is the Seventh-day Sabbath because when those items are are used in Scripture, they're either in ascending or descending order, like uh, a festival that is a yearly, um, you know, celebration tied to a month, a day. New moon is monthly, and Sabbath is weekly. So you have yearly, monthly, weekly. And they're always found in either ascending or descending order. So the fact that he says festival, that includes all the um, the yearly celebrations. Yes. And Sabbath, then, is the weekly Sabbath. And they've, they've wiggled and squirmed, and they have a new book out uh, that is... Uh, uh, written a lot of Hebrew parallel, parallelisms and so on, trying to prove that that's the Sabbath, uh, the Day of Atonement. Um, and my new, the latest issue of Sabbath in Christ, my book on the Sabbath, I asked Jerry Gladson, who is a Hebrew scholar, to uh, give a critique of that book, and it's in the back of my uh, new book, Sabbath in Christ. And it's very, very clear that it is the Seventh-day Sabbath, and it totally undermines Adventism. And they're doing everything they can to try to um, misquote that. And I think it's interesting what um, what some have said, that uh, that Sabbath day is used about uh, 60 times in Scripture. And uh, they all agree that it's Seventh-day Sabbath, except this time that Adventists disagree. But mm-hmm. commentaries say otherwise. Anyway, go ahead. Um, we we have another caller, caller 509. I know you've been waiting patiently, so um, caller 509. Yes, good morning. Uh, hey, how you doing, Richard? Not too bad. Say, I'm not going to do what Ed did to 20 minute diet right there. I can't hold a handle them. What I'd like to do is carry on a conversation with your guest, Dale, for a few mm-hmm. minutes, if I may. Dale, sure. are you there? Yes, I'm here. Richard is my name. Um, you have some very interesting things to say, very, very interesting things. And I could talk for maybe hours with you on these subjects. But one thing I'd like to bring up here, most of the time when people mention William Miller, they just don't seem to understand what's going on there. And, in fact, every time I hear them talk, they always get it wrong. Or at least I think they get it wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, who knows, you know. But I have uh, William Miller's original documents. I'm on microfilm, and I read them all. What actually happened was William Miller did not believe that Christ would come on March 22, 1843. No. What he said, now if I understand this right, you can correct me, is he actually believed that Christ would come sometime between March 22, 1843 and March 22, 1844. He never said October Twenty second, eighteen forty four, until much later, and so when he didn't come on March third, March twenty second, eighteen forty four. I mean, eighteen forty three. Then he said, "Well, we got a whole year for this to fulfill in, to complete in." 
So by the time they got to eight, March 23rd, 1844, they really disappointed. That was a disappointment at that time. However, shortly after that, in a, I think it was in May, actually, a man by the name of George Storrs contacted him mm-hmm. and another man named S.S. S. Snow. And they told him that, hey, you misunderstand these dates. Actually, there's seven months between our time and the Jewish time. So Christ was not going to come until seven months after March 1844, which gave the date October 22nd, 1844. And then that was a great disappointment at that time. And I understand that William Miller never sent another date after that time. Oh, many other people did set him a date for Christ to come, but even within 10 years of that time. But, of course, he did not come in the way he expected him to, or come at all. Am I making any sense to you, Ed? Uh, yes, I mean, that, that's well known. I mean, uh, William Miller actually admitted that he was wrong. Adventists didn't. And it's true that uh, that snow, in fact, they call that the first snow job, uh, and he, he uh, you know, and I, maybe some of our listeners don't know how they got to that. Uh, what they did, they in Daniel eight fourteen, it talks about the cleansing of the sanctuary. Okay, and in context, uh, I believe it's the cleansing of the sanctuary that uh, Judas Maccabeus did during the uh, the intertestamental period after they. The little horn had destroyed the um, the sanctuary and offered the sacrifices of pigs and things on it, uh, and, and they, using a uh, Cruden's concordance without any theological training, they said sanctuary. Okay, where in the Old Testament is a sanctuary? Well, they went to the Old Testament and the cleansing of the sanctuary. They said was uh, was the Day of Atonement. So what they did, they uh, they took the um, Daniel 8.14, and imposed the date for the cleansing of the Day of Atonement. And they, they did some research, and they thought that it was October 22, 1844, would be the day that the Day of Atonement fell, and now it's been shown that they actually actually did that wrong, too. But you're, you're correct. William Miller did not come up with the 1840, uh, the uh, October 22, that was Snow and some of the others, but Ellen, I, I was speaking to Ellen White, you know, endorsed all that stuff. Oh, she did? Oh, I, that I didn't know. And oh, yeah. I mean, she did endorse Snow and Stetson, I mean, George Storrs, Heidi on that? Well, I, I, I don't know whether she endorsed Snow or not. I, I, it's been a long time since I've read some of those things. But if you get the book Cultic Doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists, I have quite a bit of detail in there, uh, over 700 footnotes from Adventist sources. And that explains the whole um, whole series of events that transpired at the beginning of the Adventist church that most And that Adventists, name again was what that book? Give it to me one more time, would you, Dale? It's called The Cultic Doctrine of Seventh-day Adventists. And uh, just for for the listeners' sake, right now my website is closed down pretty much except for donations for our uh, our proclamation magazine. And I'll be back home again uh, near the end of September. So wait until uh, near the end of September uh, after tw- after September 20 before you try to buy it because it's not even on the on the site right now. I mean, sure. you, you can get it there if you know how to search for it, but I've taken it away so people. Uh, well, that's all right. I'm totally ignorant of the internet. I don't know anything about it. But anyway, I'll get it. I, I have other people I can get it from. Now, one other thing I'd like to ask you about, maybe you can help me out on this. I've read a long time for many, many years that the Seventh day Adventists do not believe that Christ was perfect, that he was a sinner. Can you help me out on that? Is that right or is that wrong? No, I, I, I missed your question. Say it again. I've heard the Seventh-day Adventists and read believe that Christ was a sinner. He was not perfect here on earth. Oh, okay, no. What? What? They don't believe he was a sinner, but they believe that he had the fallen nature of Adam. And, and this is another uh, another big. Whoa! Big problem. I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Well. Let, let me back off and say it, it is divided. And in Ellen White, you know, you can get both. Uh, she was a, a great plagiarist, 
And when she was quoting some good um, good evangelical theologians, she would have some good theology. And when she was quoting something else, she would have some bad theology. And when she was quoting, you know, from some of the uh, the early Adventists, who most of them were not really scholars, there there was a couple of them that were, but um, she quotes some bad theology. So you can, at one time, she says that uh, Christ came. Um, with the same heredity as the sons of of man, okay. Well, and then so the sinful nature, and then this then creates a big problem. And so Adventists don't believe in original sin. By that I mean they don't believe that we have the guilt of Adam's sin, and we just have the tendencies towards sin. And so this this influences their um, their sanctification. They say, well, you know. Christ showed that with a sinful nature, he could live a perfect life. Therefore, and he used no power that we may not have, Ellen White says. Therefore, in Adventism, there's a stress on Christ as example. And, you know, he came to give us a second probation. And this fits into their eschatology. Let me just kind of paint the, the, a little bigger picture They believe that Christ, in fact, here's a quote, Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his people. And when the character of Christ is perfectly reproduced in his people, he will come to claim them as his own. So he doesn't claim them as his own until they've perfectly reproduced his his character. And uh, right now in Adventism, there's about six different flavors of the gospel that are being taught. One of which is that um, the, the final remnant is going to perfectly keep the law, and, uh, and this is going to answer Satan's charges in their great controversy. They claim that Satan uh, admitted, so to speak, that Christ kept the law. But he says, look, nobody else has done it. I want to see a group of people keep the law. And he has claimed that God's law cannot be kept. It's too hard, and he blames God for it. So uh, Adventists see themselves as helping in this great controversy solve the problem of sin by perfectly keeping the law. So that that kind of all fits in. I don't know if that helps. Dale, may I ask you a little question? Reverse just a minute here. I don't quite understand. How can they believe that Christ had Adam's nature without being a sinner? Well, see, that's the problem. That's the big problem. And and uh, there are some theologians in Adventism that would, would go against that. And then they will quote another quotation of Ellen White, that there was not a taint of sin uh, on him. So all it depends on which quote you want to get. I see. In other words, you can jump from one horse to another. Exactly. In a way, I guess is the way you say it. Very good. Okay, I, I think you helped me understand that. And also, Gus said he didn't know that either. So it helps him out there, man. Let's yeah, see absolutely. I, I didn't know that. That's uh, that's very. Um, yeah, I didn't either. Wow, that's awkward and profound. Now, offhand, Dale, <laughs> can you give me a quote in White's writing where she says that? Yeah, uh, have offhand a quote. I mean, I've got lots of their books here. Well, at least a book source, maybe, or a journal uh, source. Yeah, I, I don't. I don't have that. Like I say, I'm. I haven't been home since June yeah. 25th. He's on the road I, right I, now, Richard. Oh, I see. Okay. Well, hey, <laughs> Dale. Dale, may I say this? May I give you my phone number, and sometimes when it's convenient to you, you can pull me those quotes. I'd really love to have them, because I know lots of Adventists there. And my number is, my, number, my name is Richard Rowey, R-A-W-E, and my phone number is 509-246-1559. That's 509-246-1559. I'd love to okay. hear from you whenever you can. Would you do one better? Would you give me a call, um, let's say, around the 1st of October? Could you do that? And I'll give you a phone number. Sure, go ahead. Okay, it's uh, area 520. 520. 836. 836. 9790. 9790. And what part of the world is that in? That's Casa Grande, Arizona. Oh, Arizona. All right, that's what I need to know. And do you get up early or late or what? I mean, when I call, early or late in the day, your time? Well, uh, my time, um, 
any time after, uh, say, 8 o'clock. Yeah, okay, damn, okay, good, I got that down. Yeah. Now, I'd like, you, uh, I'd like to ask you one more question, if I may. Well, uh, Richard, can we reserve it for another time? Because we got one more call, and we only have a, a, a few more minutes left on the program. Oh, yeah, I want to make sure they get a chance. Yeah, I love, but, thank but you for the time you gave me, guys. Yeah, uh, and we're, we're going to have Dale on again. To, you know, we're, we're going to have him in December, so. Um, you know, I could do it next week if we do it early again, uh, Okay, if you, if you want to do it this this time again, then you know. Yeah, I, I could. Uh, I was I got to thinking after we talked, you know, before the program that uh, I could as long as I do it early, like we did today. Okay, that sounds fine then. So we're gonna have Dale on again next week. So Richard, next week, yeah, right, right, yeah. Okay. I'll, thank you. All right, great, great. All right, call us seven one three. You have been very very patient. Seven one three. Hello. Hello, yes. Okay, let me uh, turn down the radio here. I've been listening to the show this morning and um, I'm very distressed. Uh, I have listened to your caller who uh, is a your guest, excuse me, past Seventh-day Adventist, I think he's a minister. But um, just knowing that certainly we are in a very critical uh, time, um, if you – Within the church, if you you want to call it that, I right. I was listening mm-hmm. to some of your previous callers, also as well as your guests, and um, we are dealing with problems of epic proportions. And when I say problems at this point, I understand the caller who uh, whose great concern was for the the confusion that's now in the church. At least that's what I'm labeling it as. I've I've heard the gentleman speak before. This is the mm-hmm. first time listening to your show, uh, uh-huh. and I just kind of want to. You know, know what is your thinking? Because uh, Ellen White, Ellen White, um, along with everyone else, are have been false messengers. And right. where? Cause my question, my question is, shall the confusion and misadministration remain forever? Because we argue about these different doctrines and tenets. We argue about certainly. Who, what we feel are uh, theologies that are inconsistent, but if you, but when you look at the scriptures, for example, the theme of Galatians, it, it doesn't say that the Lord's law is put away. What is it that's going to absorb the confusion? Uh, Paul himself said that he believed. Shaul said he looked, he believed in the promises that were given to uh, the patriarchal fathers, uh, right. the, the law and the prophets. So. If we understand then that there has been, and I think that was the caller's point, much perversion, much misadministration, much purposeful, if you will, manipulation and exploitation of the scriptures uh, that began long before Messiah's last appearance, if you will, upon the earth, then what's going to absolve that confusion at this point? Are we content simply to talk within our if you will, our expert circles, and, and I say that certainly sarcastically, uh, and never really getting at what is necessary to heal the problem. And I think that was not addressed in what your caller is saying, your guest is saying, and what the caller was saying. What are we going to do to get past at this point? Um, there are several points that I had. I know that you said that that we're short on time. But there must be and is a faith that remains beyond all the confusion, that exposes all the confusion. Grace reveals the law beyond all the confusion and the differences and the diversities of men, the, the pluralism. And I think that's the point about the plurality, the paganism that still exists. It's the, it's the consciousness that pervade, has intruded upon the faith that is now the obstacle that must be taken out of the way. Well, that's why we Hello? do programs like this because we want to expose the the pseudo from the authentic, the the false from what is true, and um, that's why we specialize in the cults. Um, I think that often that when people talk about thirty thousand denominations, which is probably a lot more than that, um, what they confuse. And speaking as a former Jehovah's Witness myself. Um, there's actually a great book I recommend to any person who has um, uh, come out of the cults, and it's called Unity and Diversity, and I believe it's by the author is um, – I'm trying to remember the author. 
Um, uh, unity and diversity in the church. Um, I can't remember the name of the author, um, but um, I'll, I'll definitely mention it in next week's program, the name of the author. But, but I think what happens is we often misappropriate uniformity for unity. And Jehovah's Witnesses and the cults, like the Seventh-day Adventists, the Mormons, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Scientologists, all declare themselves to be the one true religion. Well, and they say is- everybody, everybody is wrong and we're the only ones right. And and, and, and what, what they mean by that is, and, and their, their their primary reason for saying that is they say that Christianity is in confusion. Uh, huh? Yeah, I'm asking you what is in a cult? Because the scriptures, according to the scriptures, that Messiah must come to absolve the confusion, and he is going to right. definitely declare well, what is. Well, so the, the, that's, that's, that's the thing problem? is... There is there is no confusion. That's the thing is that the, is the, no that, that, that that's a, that's an assumption. The assumption that there are thirty thousand denominations believing thirty thousand different things is is a assumption. The fact is that I've had Catholics, I've had Orthodox, and I've had Protestants, and for the most part, Christianity we we actually agree on about ninety percent of the things. Okay. What, but what we call cults are the ones that remove themselves out of those core things that we do agree upon. Um, there, there's an old adage by St. Augustine. He says, in essentials, unity, in non-essentials, liberty, and in all things, charity. And so there is a core that has survived that has stood the test of time, that Christians have always believed for 2,000 years. So you're saying that the gospel has been preserved and the gospel is intact in what is believed? Absolutely. Absolutely. And not only that, not only do I say that, but Paul says that. Paul says that in the book of 1 Timothy, he says that about the apostasy. He said that they would be like Jannies and Jambres. But he says, but their folly will be clear to everyone. And so... Apostasy was right there in the midst of the church. In fact, Paul's letters that he was writing to was to alert the congregations that this is apostasy and that is apostasy and remove that away from you. In Corinthians, he tells them to remove a man who was sleeping with his his uh, his stepmother, to remove that man. So Paul's letters are always gauged at purifying the Christian church as it existed then, and he passed on his faith to others. He mentions Clement in Philippians 4.3, which is Clement of Rome. And Clement of Rome is one of the elders in the churches there. And, and they continue to pass that faith down faithfully, in fact. And, and so what we have here is when, when, when we have the Adventists and the Jehovah's Witnesses, they actually appear a lot like the heretical groups that existed in the first 400 years of the Christian church. The, the Jehovah's Witnesses look a lot like the Ebionites and the Arianites. Um, the Adventists, in, the, in, in, in their, um, uh, they uh, appear a lot like the Ebionites also. Uh, and so if, if, if you learn about what all, the, all the, these false sects were teaching in the first 400 years of the Christian church and how we got the Bible, and then you easily recognize that, hey, this looks just like it, this third century sect. It came out in the 1800s. It's been regurgitated. The devil just spit it back out 1,800 years later. And so um, the fact is that the gospel has been preserved. And it has. Now, what's your definition of the gospel? Because if the gospel, as I understand it, and, you know, when you – and the caller, previous caller, he talked about Matthew, I think, 28, it's called, typically known, I think, as the great dispensation or the, the command uh, to go forth and teach the nations. And if you understand that the nations were founded upon corruption at that point, exactly. and you're saying that that word has gone forth and has succeeded in eradicating all the corruption, the gospel is an untainted word that's pure and perfect. If Christ is that word from the beginning, and we realize right. Those, that initial foundation does not entertain, or let's just say, uh, the holy foundation is not founded upon the imaginings, any of what is the imaginings or the deviations of mean or any of 
what we now call denominations, whether it's uh, cult, uh, cultism in the form of you know, some of the some of the uh, belief systems that you just mentioned, or any mm-hmm. other form. Are you saying that this faith is what was instituted by the Messiah himself, and that the apostles himself taught? Or absolutely. All the verse two, you absolutely. Absolutely. Like, that's, that's startling to me. <laughs> that's quite startling to me that you, you'd say that, sir. But, you know, certainly this is a conversation that, that must continue because, you know, just from I don't profess to be an expert student of history, uh, mm. nor having the command of, I feel, Scripture uh, as I should, but I, from the essence of what I, the Creator has revealed, and what has been said in terms of what must be solidified as as salvation has not been preserved. It's to deliver humanity from the confusion. It seems like what we endorse now as theologians, as teachers, exacerbates it. It maintains the confusion, and that seems that's what I'm hearing. But, that, here. That, like I said, that well, that's because the devil wants to make it appear as confusion, and he is he you know he wants to make. Christianity appears as it's confused, but I can tell you right now, I've been in 12 years as a, well, 15 years as a Christian. I've been in about five different churches, and I have no problem with any of those five churches. I know most of the most as I've left is because of location or stylistic difference, but nothing really doctrinally uh, that much different that that would cause me to separate from them in some you know accusation, um, and so. Uh, and I've been I've been in a Baptist church. I've been in a Lutheran churches. I've been in evangelical free church. I've been in non denominational churches, and yet they all, if you if you just look at the faith statements of any of those, they pretty much agree on about ninety percent of the things that they agree on. So there there is an essentials but that I would, churches. I would say that they mostly, not to interrupt, but that they hmm. all agree that the creator has put away his law. That there's no law, and I would think that simply that. You know, that, um, if you will, uh, allegiance that they have, the premise that they all are willing to uphold, that it's certainly okay to disagree disagree with the Creator and that he has no rule. If you're not under his law, whose law you're under? That's well, that, that, well that, that's, the, that's the thing is, is that uh, if, if we're living by the law, then we're, we're under a curse because, see, we cannot please God by the law. It's impossible to please God by the law, which is the purpose of this program. Dale, did you want to comment on that? Yes. Uh, you know, yeah, they say that there's a confusion of the gospel. That is absolutely not correct. The gospel is very simple. Let me just read a couple of verses. Now I'm making, this is First Corinthians 15. I'm sure you've read it many times. Now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you. Okay, this is the gospel which also you were uh, received in which you are saved. If you hold fast the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain. Here it is. For I delivered to you, first of all, the importance of what I also received, that Christ died for our sins, according to scriptures. He was buried, and that he was raised the third day, according to the scriptures, and he appeared to Cephas, and then to the twelve. And then adding to that Romans uh, 10, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness. So our righteousness is only by believing, not by keeping the law. And with mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. And Paul says in Galatians, um, let me flip over here, Galatians 2.20, uh let's see if I can find Galatians here. <laughs> Hello? Just a second. Yeah. Let me read one more. Uh, in Galatians 2, he says, um, I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness comes through the law, then died needlessly. If, if righteousness comes through what? The misadministration of man, not the law as divinely conceived and inspired. Do you yes. think that it's, that no, that's not what Paul is referring to? Paul always uses law to refer to the Mosaic law. 
Often now, the total I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm sure. Have you looked at that closely? You know, that's one aspect of, of the scriptures that I've looked at there. And there was no word, as the, the caller said before you, that was definitely no word to differentiate between civil law and divine law. And you're saying in every instance that Shaul was referring to divine law only as being the, the corruption or what needed to be taken out of the way that was put aside? He said the change in the law had to do with the priest. If Paul refers to law, I would say not necessarily 100% because he talks about uh, other civil laws at times, but he almost always refers to the uh, the Torah. I think that that's an extreme bias. And if you understand the your host was talking about doing the Nicene Council, that many of the edicts that were written, if you go back and look uh, at the uh, what precipitated what was the, if you will, motivation for these clergymen, if you will, coming together, much of what came out of there was against what had been the faith, and it was upholding what had been their polytheistic foundations. There were edicts no. against keeping that's, the Shabbat. There was a that's, not against, that's not true. That's not true. Then just throw that Bible that you got away because, no, 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 because the Bible that you had that was canonized, that was canonized, canonized at that council, was based upon the witness of the people that the apostles passed the faith down and those people passed the faith down to the people that were there at Nicaea that were present. And so it, 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 there's, a, there's been a succession of the faith being passed on. That's why the scriptures, Paul talks about staying in the apostles' teaching. He says that, that we should... Uh, that that we should preserve the faith that was once delivered uh, you're, unto you're all saying, the saints. You're saying that the West has pres- that the faith was preserved. What you was call it the West, but it wasn't the West at Nicaea. It, it was the West and East was, meeting. I, I understand, but they had been overcome by Western influence at that point. What no, was that's point? not true. That's not true. You you, you got to learn your history. <laughs> That's the, not schisms true. That, the schisms that had occurred, what about the Inquisition and the millions that were killed in the Inquisition? Okay, that has nothing to do with what happened in Nicaea, though. Okay. Well, I, at I'm Nicaea, simply you, I'm simply at Nicaea you, there were African, African Christians, there were Greek Christians, I don't, and there were Latin matter, Christians. It doesn't matter their ethnicity or their national affiliation. Well, you keep on calling it the West, I'm saying but it wasn't the West. Of a consciousness, of an outlook, if you will. No, no, I'm talking no. no. Western in terms of what, and Rome was the dominant, if you will, influence in no, the there, area. Oh, there was no Western thought at that time. It was either you were from the West or you were from the East. Western philosophy or Western thought didn't take place until Rome went West into Europe. Okay, so you're confusing what happened in Europe as opposed to what happened in the early church by calling it Western Christianity and Eastern Christianity. Well, there were no was- divisions. In, in, in Nicaea, there were no divisions. And, and, and in fact, I, I work in a building last night that is filled uh-huh. with Ethiopian Orthodox people that believe the same <laughs> things that Catholics believe, and yet they're from Ethiopia, they're from the East. So the whole idea that there's a, there's a Western in, in, infiltration, I'm sorry, there were Eastern fathers that were there, there were Eastern bishops. So I, I, I just say that. Your history is absolutely mistaken, and and until you really, really, really do some reading in history, um, you have a complete revisionism of what really took place at Nicaea. And that's what I did when I was a Jehovah's Witness. I believe that Nicaea was corrupted by Constantine, and he just took over and well, infiltrated the ideas of, of men. I, and I that, wasn't a, that, that wasn't the truth. Constantine alone, I'm just telling you the whole thought form that was the foundation of belief for the West and for those territories. The foundation of belief that was there in Nicaea were the predecessors to those men who were serving as bishops. Most of those men were impoverished, were afraid to even show up there because they thought it was a, it was a, that, that mm-hmm. they were going to get killed. They, they still didn't believe Constantine's conversion, uh, just like they didn't believe Paul's conversion completely. Well, so. Constantine- Conversion was a mock conversion. It, it was not legitimate. No, it wasn't. It wasn't a mock conversion. Constantine did the right thing as a ruler. He waited because he knew that his hands would be blood guilty. He, he, in fact, Constantine did a smart thing because he knew that he could not be a political ruler 
and be a Christian uh-huh. at the same time. So he reserved his baptism till he till he was on his deathbed because he knew he had to make decisions as a ruler that there is no way he could make as a Christian. There's a lot of, of things admirable about Constantine if you do the history and read what? about what he the kind of man that he was. You said a lot of things about what he did was admirable. So you believe yes. he was the teacher of the gospel? He may he defended the the gospel. The, the, the as, gospel. as a as a political ruler, he cared about the equality of people. And 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 let me tell you how much he cared about it. Even yes. though the decision went for the Trinity at Nicaea. He imprisoned Athanasius because Athanasius uh, went overboard with his civic power, and 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 he exiled him twice. So he was a very unbiased man. Um, I, 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 um, we're, we're at the end of the program, but we're going to have Dale on next week, and I thank you for calling in. And once again, my number is available if anybody wants to discuss this on the you know off the air. Um, Probably not not until probably about one o'clock because um, I'm, I actually have to go to work. But my number is available two zero two two eight one ninety four fifty, and I'd be glad to talk about what happened in the early church. Um, I'm, I'm an avid reader of the patristics, and and I'm, all I can say is once you know how the Bible was formed, you understand that um, these these suppositions. These revisionisms are absolutely untrue. So thank you for calling, 713. What's your name, ma'am? Uh, my name is uh, Sharon. Uh, but, sir, I would say that if nothing else, I think that it's important to agree that, uh, well, and I guess there's no agreement because my position is certainly that there is mass confusion. And I think that the prevalence of what we see in terms of the multi-denominational climate, if you will, suggests that there's been much, if you will, error that has, it's not absolution. Absolution does not allow for a multitude of different belief systems. If, if it is the one faith that has been preserved, then certainly we wouldn't see the misrepresentation and so many of what is called Christianity at this point. And so I would ask you, what per, for what purpose did the Messiah comes or any prophet that well, I would say that, 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 that those that misrepresent, that's what I, I would say that those that misrepresent Christianity are not Christians, that they're Sir? cults. Uh-huh. Yeah, I would say that those that you say that mis- – and I can understand how you come to those conclusions based on what you believe about what happened then because um, that's the conclusions I had based upon what I believe that happened then. But um, like I said, we'll be on the air next week this the same time, and we're going to have um, our, our guest Dale again. Um, but thank you for calling in. Call in, and maybe we can answer, we'll have some time to answer those questions next week, or you can call me on my personal number. Thank you, sir. All right. your thank you. Thank you for calling in. Um, 661, I'm sorry we we couldn't get to you today. Please call in next week. Listen to the program next week. Um, the book that I was trying to remember is Diversity in Faith, Unity in Christ by Shirley C. Guthrie, Jr. Diversity in Faith, Unity in Christ. Um, and I just really highly recommend that book to give you a good perspective of how Christianity can be diverse and yet unified, and that people perceive diversity as just as division, and, and that's not the case. Dale? Yes. I'm sorry. <laughs> thank you for calling. Thank you for being our guest this week. Look forward to having you on next week. We'll talk a little more next week. Um, this same time is good for you, 9 o'clock, right? Yeah, that's that's fine. Uh, call me again, uh, you know, a half hour beforehand just to make sure. Okay, great. Um, um, thank you for being such a patient guest. Um, and uh, we gave a lot of time to our callers. And um, and I just hope that we can clarify some of those things. And and uh, and you know, just uh, I just would say that um, Jesus Christ, just pray to Christ. Pray to Christ to clarify any issues you have, and he won't let you down. That's for sure. Um, we have reached at the end of the program. Next week we'll be on again, 9 o'clock Eastern time. Dale will be with us. We'll talk about Adventism some more, and maybe we'll talk about legalism and grace. Um, 
and um, what that means. And um, so um, I encourage you, go to our archives. Uh, we have a blog site, healingxjws.com. And uh, we thank you for listening. We thank you for supporting us. We are listening to Supported Radio. And um, we're going to end like we, what we've been doing uh, with a Christian hip-hop song by Christ Centric is Fight for the Children. It's an anthem for uh, for life, for children, uh, against abortion. And the title of the CD is The Ephesians Project. And we look forward to having you on again next week, uh, 9 o'clock Eastern Time, where we'll have our guest, Dale Ratzliff, former Seventh-day Adventist pastor. And go to his website. Go to lifeassuranceministries.org. And uh, take a look at his blog and his articles. Uh, he has a great um, uh, e-zine or magazine called Proclamation. Take a look at it, and what uh, and he discusses some of the issues we discussed today there in his magazine. So um, God bless you, and look forward to seeing you next week. Please pray for Seven Day Adventists. Please pray for Jehovah's Witnesses, and God bless you all. Bye bye. <laughs>